So we're going through Deuteronomy. We're still in the Torah portions and such. And uh, we're in Deuteronomy chapter 11. But I was going to start off, it may seem strange, you know, I'm talking about the Samaritans and the true Messiah. But that's, that's where we're starting today. And when you look at, you think about the Samaritans, of course, you typically only think of them in the New Testament and such. They, they show up in John chapter 4, and it says, uh, in talking about Yeshua, and in talking about some of his travels through the area, it says that he left Judea and went back again to the Galilee, but he needed to pass through Samaria. And uh, quiz, you know, did the Samaritans and the Jews like each other very much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not so much. Uh, so he came to a Samaritan town called Shechem near the plot of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And now Jacob's well was there. And so Yeshua, exhausted from the journey, was sitting by the well, and it was mid midday. So when you look at, you know, at God's people, when you look at all these things, you know, the Samaritans essentially were, were a mixture. Uh, you, you have, you know, Israel all the way back here, all the way starting back with the patriarchs and leading all the way into the United Kingdom of David and Solomon. Uh, of course, after Solomon or after Solomon dies, you know, you see the kingdom gets divided. And uh, into the, the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel. And that doesn't always go so well, especially for the northern kingdom, uh, because as they are there in the northern kingdom, you know, they get, uh, they get captured first by the nation of Assyria in about 622 B.C., and, and the, so the Assyrians then come back and they bring new people into the, into the land, into the area that they had defeated elsewhere. That was part of their relocation process. You know, so the Israelites in the northern kingdom, they had spiraled off into idolatry, into, into, they had broken from Jerusalem and Judah and such. And all of these new peoples, these pagans from other places, came in and began to live in the, the same area, the same town, and so these conquered peoples and the, the remnant of the northern kingdom of Israel began to blend and mix together. And they eventually became what, uh, what, we, would, what we would call the Samaritans. They had a very mixed belief system. They, they combined things that were brought in by these foreign peoples with the, the remnants of the faith or the understanding of the God of Israel in the northern kingdom. But again, even the northern kingdom was was off on its theology and its practice uh, of things. And so they had spiraled off into things where they have been led by many numerous uh, kings who did evil in the eyes of the Lord and such. Uh, but, so these Samaritans in the, in the New Testament era, in the, the days of Yeshua, they controlled these towns like Shechem. Um, you know, they, they had the territory that where the inheritance of Joseph, Joseph was given, where Jacob's well was. They had all of that. And so they, the Samaritans were preserving some semblance of the ancient faith. They were preserving some of the names. They were preserving some of the knowledge. And when you look at that conversation with the Samaritan woman, you know, she, she agrees with some of that. She participates with that. You know, she's talking with Yeshua. She says, well, you're not f greater than our father Jacob, are you? You know, he's the one, he gave us this well, he drank out of it himself with his sons and his camel. So, who is she claiming to be her, her father, her spiritual ancestor? She's claiming Jacob. As a Samaritan, she's claiming Jacob. Uh, she considers her people are inheritors of that work that he had done, of, of the, the well that he had made. Just a little bit further in verse 19, she says, uh, Sir, the woman tells him, I see that you are a prophet. So what, is, what does she recognize right there? She's recognizing that God will send prophets, right? That there is an office of prophet. And then she says, you know, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you all say, you, you Jewish people say, that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. This whole conversation is in this Torah portion about why this is necessary. Uh, back in Deuteronomy 11 and 12 and such. 
He says, Yeshua tells her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So that's part of chapter 12, or I'm sorry, part of chapter 11, where they pronounce the blessing and the cursing that we read about earlier on Mount Gerizim, the blessings on Mount Gerizim, the curses on Mount Ebal, and they are going, she's pointing up at the mountain, they're at the base of Mount Gerizim and saying that this is where we go, this is where we worship, on this mountain here, Mount Gerizim. So she considers worshiping on Mount Gerizim to be equivalent to worshiping where? She, can, she considers that the same thing as worshiping in Jerusalem. That's as important to her as it is to him. Now, here's the next thing. When Yeshua talks to her, he, he says, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Who is worshiping the Father? Her. Her and the Samaritan people. Who is Yeshua saying that their worship is going to be a part of or accepted by God. Hers. See, the Jewish people and the Samaritans didn't get along, didn't like each other very much, especially the Jewish people toward them. Uh, so there was hostility there. But he is saying, you're going to worship. And your worship is going to be, you're going to be worshiping the Father just like I would be worshiping the Father, just like any of us would be worshiping the Father. You know, he says, he goes on to say, you know, you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He says, you will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Right? That's how he defines what true worship is. So she's recognizing the office of prophet. She's, she's saying she's in, in uh, compliance. She thinks she's in compliance with what the Old Testament says in worshiping on Gerizim. Uh, but And then Yeshua even says that her worship will one day be accepted as proper and right. So he says, in this next passage in, chapter, in verse 25, the woman tells him, well, look, I know that Messiah is coming. You know, he who's called the Anointed One. When he comes to you, he will explain everything to us. And Yeshua tells her, I, the one speaking to you, you know, I am. I am that one. I am he. So what do you learn about her and what the Samaritans believe in this passage? Is she expecting a Messiah? Yes, she sure is. She's expecting it a lot. And she understands that when Messiah comes, he's going to address all of these issues and all of these debates and all of these questions that they have that they're disagreeing on, who's going to settle it? Yeah. Messiah is. Messiah is going to settle. He's going to explain. He's going to teach the, the Torah correctly. He's going to correct everyone's practice. Everything that everybody's doing wrong, he's going to fix it. So the Samaritans have a lot of things in common with the Jews and Judaism, don't they? Yeah. You look at this. You know, the, the divided kingdom, Judah and Israel and Samaritans and such as that. The, the Samaritans that we see here in John chapter 4, some of the things that we understand about them, they were seen by the Jews as, they, the Jews understood that these guys are related to us. All right? We may not like them, you know, it's a family squabble where you, you, you gripe at and disagree with most the people that you are closest to so many times, right? They understood that they were related to them, you know, they, they shared a similar beliefs and foundations. They had a, a, an understanding of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had that foundation of the patriarchs. Uh, they shared similar scriptures. Uh, you know, the Samaritans had their own copy of the Pentateuch, their own translation of that that they kept and preserved. They didn't in, want to include any of the other prophets. They didn't want to include any of the other writings. They kept strictly to the Samaritan Pentateuch. And it's actually pretty insightful to go and look at it. Um, but even though they had all of these things that they shared, the Jewish people especially still saw them as significantly different to the point that they could not fellowship or worship together. Right? You with me on that? So they were, they were different enough 
know, they divided over the prophets and some of the extra writings. They divided over where should we worship? Should we worship here on Mount Gerizim or do we have to go to Jerusalem? So they were seen, the Samaritans, even though they had all this stuff in common, they still were seen as living by a different way. And for all practical purposes, in the eyes of the Jewish people, they were serving a different God. You know, they were, they were, the Samaritans were living in that legacy of the divided kingdom, you know, where the, when the northern kingdom broke away from the southern kingdom of Judah, they did it over the Torah, they did it over the place of worship and the general acceptance of all those pagan practices. That's what the northern kingdom broke away from and accepted and adopted. So in the eyes of the Jewish people, the Samaritans couldn't be living in the blessing of the Father. And if you're not receiving the blessing of obedience to the Father and His Word, what are you experiencing, should be experiencing instead? The curse. The curse, right? So they understood that they would be living with the curse. And so that takes us to uh, what we see in Deuteronomy. Chapter 11, verse 26, he says, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the mitzvot, to the commands of Adonai your God, that I am commanding you today, but the curse, if you do not listen to the mitzvot of Adonai your God, but turn from the way I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. Verse 29 goes on and says, Now when Adonai your God brings you into the land you are going to possess... You are to set the blessing on Mount Gerizim, which is where the Samaritans base their worship, and the curse on Mount Ebal. You know, they're right on the other side of a valley. They're looking at each other. They can see each other from both sides. Uh, and Shechem is right down at the base of those two mountains. That's where they were, where Jesus was, where Yeshua was. So they were to, to Mount Gerizim is, is Mount Gerizim insignificant? No. It's actually pretty important. That was one of the first things they were supposed to do when they go in the land. So it's not as if that there is absolutely no connection that these Samaritans are just pulling some place out of the air and saying, hey, we're going to worship here. No, there's a reason why they go to Mount Gerizim. And they think they're being more faithful by going there. Um, so that's, that's, you know, Mount Gerizim is where they would worship at. They're seeking the blessing of God. You know, the Jews in the days of Yeshua believed they couldn't experience them because they were not worshiping in the place that God chose to make his name dwell. That's in chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, uh, verse 11. It says, The place Adonai your God chooses to make his name dwell, there are to you, to, you are to bring all that I have commanded you, all your burnt offerings, all your sacrifices, all those things. So even though they weren't even in the land yet, even though they hadn't conquered a single thing yet, did God know what he was doing and where he was going to take them and what he was going to do in the sense of Jerusalem is going to be the place where my temple is built? Did he have all of that in mind, all this ahead of time? Yeah, he sure did. All right? So it's in the Torah that he is going to pick a specific place and it implies that it's not going to be Mount Gerizim because if he would have wanted that. He hasn't told them what the name of the place is yet. He's telling them Mount Gerizim, but he hasn't told them the name of where he's going to place his name yet. So there should be some hints that it's not the same. But, so all of this stuff here in Deuteronomy chapter 11, all of this idea of the blessing and the curses are built into the Torah. And here's the thing, all people, whether they are directly in, in the covenant or not, are going to experience the same. We're going to experience the blessing and the cursing. We're going to experience one or the other. Because the commands of God, the Torah, the instruction of God, those are based on His nature. The Torah and the commands are based on His character his holiness. That's the standard by which God judges all people. God judges the world. The Torah is him telling us, these are my instructions. This is how you please me. This is what my holiness, I define my holiness. The Torah is just him telling us what those are. 
but he is judging all peoples by that standard all the time in every time because everyone is is born under the law we all experience the curse of the law we all experience death don't we because of sin all right Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says you know the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of, of men in unrighteousness they suppress the truth of course what's the truth it's his word isn't it uh, because what can be known about God is plain to them for God has shown it to them his invisible attributes his eternal power his divine nature have been clearly seen ever since when ever since Mount Sinai and the giving of the Torah no ever since the creation of the world being understood through the things that have been made so that people are without excuse right? there is enough out there for us to know that God is there that we should be seeking after him that he is justified and he is right in his judgment of us because we sin you know everyone is born under the law we all experience the curse of the law we all experience death because of sin because we are all for all practical purposes we are all going after other gods we are all living by a way that is not his way does that make sense Romans 3.23 says, They all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have fallen short of the way that is His way that He defines. Romans chapter 2, verse 12 says, There will be trouble and hardship for every human soul that does evil. Is anybody left out of that? <laughs> no. no. All right. We all are doing evil in some way or another. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. But there will be glory, honor, and shalom, or peace, to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Of course, who defines what is good? He does. Where does he define what is good? In his Torah, in his word. All right? For there is, for, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. In other words, is he going to judge the Jewish people by a different standard than he does the Greek people? No. no. He's going to use the same standard of, of righteousness, the same standard of holiness that he for the Jewish people as he does for the Greek people because that's his nature. He defines what is evil. He defines what is good. And so we are all under that curse of the law because if you... Don't keep it. If you disobey it, that brings death. All right? For all who have sinned outside of Torah will also perish outside of Torah. Even if you don't have it, you're still going to experience it. You're going to still experience the, the curse of the Torah. And all who have sinned according to Torah are going to be judged by the Torah. So you're not, you're not off the hook for anything if you're not in the covenant if you're not in the Torah you're still going to experience the punishment for sin and that is death okay so individuals whole and then also whole peoples or whole nations are held to that standard of God's holiness that's set forth in the Torah that's why you know they too experience death it's why the land you know before the Israelites came in and uh, dispersed everybody you know, the land, he was saying, the land will spit them out because of all of their ungodliness, because of all of their idolatry, because of all the, the hideous things that they were doing. The land would spit them out. And they weren't in covenant with him at all. And they were still held to that standard. This is chapter 12, verse 29. He says, when Adonai your God cuts off before you, the nations that you're going in to dispossess, when you have dispossessed them and settled in their land, be careful not to be trapped into imitating them after they have been destroyed before you. Do not inquire about their gods, saying, well, how do these nations serve their gods? I'll do the same. You are not to act like this toward Adonai your God. For every abomination of Adonai which he hates, they have done to their gods. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. 
So it's all those things that he hates that these, these pagan nations have been doing. He says he is using the Israelites to judge them according to his standard of righteousness and holiness. And so they are being kicked out of the land. And then he also gives exactly the same warning to the Israelites who are going in in their place. He says, oh, by the way, just because you're judging, I'm using you to judge them, don't go doing the same things that they did because then I'll use the same standard upon you. Right? He uses the same standard for both Jew and Gentile. And this is the challenge. You know, some of our traditional theology seems to think that the Torah of God is the curse. That having the Torah is what's bad. Or it, it is the curse that he puts upon us. That it's such a great and terrible burden that to have and live by the Torah is just the worst thing, worst existence you could have. That it has in essence become, that the Torah has in essence become sin for the believer. That the Torah is death for the believer. That's what some of our traditional theology has taught. But that's not even what Paul argues for. Romans chapter 7, he says, So then the Torah is what? Holy. It's holy. This is way past the resurrection. He's still saying the Torah is holy. And the commandments are, is holy and righteous and good. Has his opinion of the Torah changed when he became a believer in Messiah? No, he believed that before. He should have anyway. Uh, he says, verse 13, Therefore did that which is good become death to me? He says, may it never be. He was like, no way. Rather, it's not that the Torah has become bad and has become death to me. Rather, it's the continuous working of sin that's working death in me. Through that, even which is good, you know, through that which is good, so that sin might be shown to be sin, and so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. It's through the Torah that we get to really understand and know this is what displeases God. This is the stuff that he really hates. This is the stuff he does not want to be a part of the life of the believer. It's only through reading and studying the Torah, reading and studying the Scriptures, that we come to know just how bad sin is and how our lives need to change. That's what the Torah is supposed to do in us. And is that something just for the Jewish people that need to know that? Or does everybody kind of need to know that? Wouldn't the world be a whole lot better if everybody knew what God expects of us and how He wants us to live? See, the problem is the breaking of the Torah, not the Torah. It's the breaking of the Torah that's the problem. So the sin that's at work in our life, that's what death is. That's what the curse is. And we need to be set free from the law of sin and death. We need to be set free from the curse of the law, which is the breaking of it. The same Torah can be at work. And here's the thing we need to understand is the Torah automatically going to, to bring death? I mean, is, is the curse the only option? No. He says, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Right? The blessings come when you obey the Torah. The curses come when you break it. Right? And what does he always say at the end of, of Deuteronomy, at the end of Joshua? He says, I set before you today life and death blessing and cursing. I want you to choose life. He wants us to choose the blessing because he actually does want to bless us. That's an amazing thing to understand sometimes. He wants us to keep and guard his Torah because he wants to pour out his blessings upon his people. And now to be clear, does, that, does our keeping of Torah ever undo the effect or the presence of sin in our life? Does that ever save us, is keeping the Torah? No, it doesn't save us. That's Romans 3.20. No human on the basis of Torah observance will be set right in his sight, for through the Torah comes the awareness of sin. I understand that I am a sinner through the word of God. 
So Torah is not and has never been about earning somebody's salvation. Romans and Galatians especially refute that idea and establish that justification before God is by, uh, is by faith. But a saved person, a saved person, can we not still experience the blessing? Can we not still experience the blessing of obedience? You know, it does, you know, our salvation, does it ever give us license to sin more so that grace may increase? <laughs> Doesn't he specifically say no <laughs> to that? See, if I become an even bigger sinner, here's, here's the reasoning that some people will use. If I become even a bigger sinner, then his grace looks even more amazing. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's exactly the opposite of the tack we're supposed to take. So even in Messiah, we are not given freedom to disobey his word. Even in Messiah, we are called to obey the scriptures because that's a life of blessing. Instead, we are called to be transformed from our old way of life of sin into a new way of life that is his way. We are called to actually greater obedience to the ways of God, to his Torah, as a saved person. He is inviting us to a life of blessing. Because it's now that in Messiah, we have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us to help us. And for the first time since we have the Holy Spirit, we have the power to overcome our sin nature. We have the power to resist sin and disobedience. Really, for the first time, we can choose the blessing instead of only experiencing the curse. The Holy Spirit never gives us license to sin. So think about it like this. Consider what commandment of God, now that you are in Christ, what permission of God do you have to break? <laughs> Any of them? Yeah. I mean, he says, yeah, okay, I know I've been telling you not to do this, but now that you're really mine, you can do that. Is that how it works? That's one of the weird things about, about Islamic theology. All the things that are denied to people here on earth, they get to have in abundance in eternity, in their, their version of eternity. So what does that tell you? So that tells them that those, those rules are not universal. Those rules are not based on his holiness. They're about indulgence. Mm -hmm. you, know? you get to experience all the things that I said you couldn't do. Then that's not his holiness at all. All right? Yeah. So, being delivered from the curse, being delivered from the curse by Messiah Yeshua does not mean that we are free to disobey God's commandments and walk in other ways. Because the true Messiah will never let us or give us permission to do that. The true Messiah will not add to or take away from the Torah of God. That's chapter 13 in this portion. He says, whatever I command you, you must take care to do. You are not to add to it or take away from it. Then he says, suppose a prophet or a dreamer of dreams rises up among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder he spoke to you comes true. While saying, let us follow other gods that you've not known and let us serve them. Verse 4 says, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Adonai your God is testing you to find out whether you love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Adonai your God will you will Adonai your God you will follow and him you will fear. His mitzvot you will keep. To his voice you will shema or listen. Him you will serve and to him you will cling. You will cling, and that word cling is the same kind of word that's talked about husband and wife. You will cling together to the Lord. So in the true Messiah, we do not have permission to change or to add to or to take away from the Father's commands and His Torah because they are His commands, not ours. We don't get to set the standards. He does. And he does not change. And so if, if the Lord does not change, is he going to change them? No. So no person, no one has the authority, even if they are accompanied 
by all sorts of signs and wonders and the miraculous. There is no sign or wonder that gives anybody permission to negate or undo the commands, the instruction, the Torah of God. Even what we see with our eyes, you know, even these miracles that are right there before everybody, does not negate what we hear and what we read in the Word of God. Okay? Because that's what Yeshua warned us about. Matthew 24 says, For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and do what? Show great signs and wonders. For what purpose? To lead people astray, to take off the path and the ways of God, if possible, even the chosen, even the elect, that's how some of the other translations put it. The purpose of the false messiah, the purpose of their signs and their wonders and their events that they do are intended to lead people astray, to take them away from the true way of God as laid out by his Torah, the found, which is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. False prophets, false messiahs will say that there's another way other than the way, the truth, and the life. False prophets and false messiahs will say you can ignore the ways of God, you can ignore the commandments of God, you can, and the Torah of God, you can mix the ways of other ways with the ways of God. You can mix the truth of God with error. You can encourage this lawlessness, which is walking away from the ways of God. And of course, when you see the word law in the New Testament, most of the time in a Jewish culture, in most cases, it's referring back to the Torah. Mm -hmm. Law is the Torah in most cases in the New Testament. So using phrases like that we do in our Christian circles, which have mixtures of truth in them, where we say you are no longer under Torah, but under what? What's the word there? You're no longer under law, but under grace, mm -hmm. which is true. There's an element of truth in that uh, because you have been set free from the curse of the Torah. You've been set free from that punishment of sin and death, right? You've been set free by Beshua, but we are not then given freedom to live however we want. That's the lie. Yeah. We are not free to commit adultery because we've become a believer. We are not free to commit murder, to steal, or to lie. We are not free to pursue after gods, other gods, and pursue after their ways, and so profane his name. So nor are we free from the consequences of our bad decisions. Mm -hmm. Right? That yeah. we would have, you know, if we had followed and walked in the ways of God, we might not have made them. Had we lived by the Torah, right, we might not have done some of the things that we have done and so experience the consequences of those things so we are not free even from the discipline of the Lord for when we do get off of his path try to do get us back on. steer us back on his path and he'll discipline us if he loves us which he does so he's going to call us to that holy life that set apart life which is that life by the, the Torah and the word of God nor can we expect the blessings of God to be poured out upon us if our lives are marked by disobedience. It's, it's the Antichrist who promises all of that. It's the Antichrist who promises a salvation that is free from the ways of God. It's the Antichrist that does it with signs and wonders. It's the Antichrist who is known as the lawless one, the Torah-less one, the one who is without, the one who is against the Torah. And that agent of lawlessness or Torahlessness is already at work in the world and has been all this time. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already operating. This is an ongoing issue, an ongoing problem. Uh, the mystery of Torahlessness is already at work. The, the effort to try to get the people of God and the world to go further away from his ways. He says, uh, only there is one who holds back just now until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one, which is who? That's the Antichrist. 
the lawless one will be revealed. The Torahless one, the one who's against the Torah, will be revealed. The Lord Yeshua will slay him with the breath of his mouth and wipe him out with the appearance of his coming. But the coming of the lawless one is connected to the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. So is he going to be impressive when he shows up? Yes. Say. He's going to be able to do a lot of stuff that most of us are not going to be able to explain. And it's probably going to be on TV for the whole world to see. Mm. It's going to make the news. It's going to be the headlines. You know, the urgent alert about things that's happening. You should see what this guy just did. And people are going to be amazed. All right? And so he is connected to the activity of Satan with every kind of wicked deception toward who? Those who are perishing. They're the ones that are receiving and accepting all the stuff that he's doing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth so as to be saved. So the one who advocates for leaving the Torah is connected to the uh, activity of Satan, right? That's, that's, who, who, that's who advocates saying that the Torah is done away with. And he is the one who is the false messiah, just as Deuteronomy 13 talks about. And that's despite all of the flash, all of the show, all of the miracles. It's the Antichrist who wants to get us to get away from the Torah and the way, away from the ways of God. He is, the, he is the one that's advocating against the Torah of God. And it's one of the ways in which, in which the enemy speaks against the Most High. It's how the Antichrist knows who to target with his persecutions. All right, that's Daniel chapter 7. He, this is talking about the Antichrist. He will speak words against the Most High, and he'll continually harass the Kedoshim, the Holy One, the saints of the Most High, and will try to change the appointed times, which is, uh, this is in Aramaic, but that, this will be the equivalent of the feasts, and the, the law, the Torah. The, the Holy Ones, the saints, will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. All right, so one of the ways that the Antichrist works against, speaks against the Most High is by trying to change the feasts and the Torah. And he uses that to target the, the saints of God. That's how the Antichrist is going to know who to go after, is those who are keeping his Torah and those who are accepting his new law, his new way. See, what we don't realize, when you look at the, the true Messiah, what we don't realize is that to the Jewish people, to the Jewish perspective, several elements of Christian theology lead them to conclude that Yeshua is not the Messiah. Some of the stuff that we have said traditionally over the centuries lead them to think that he is not a true messiah but a false prophet and the anti-messiah you know we use the passages like uh, matthew 5 17 i did not come to abolish but to fulfill we or we say things romans 10 4 that christ is the end of the law or we say things like you know that jesus kept the law so we don't have to which may have elements of truth in them but we use them to mean that we have no relationship to Torah anymore. That strategy of Satan has been very successful. It's been very it? successful. So to the Jewish mind, when they hear us argue that and say those kind of things, they hear us saying that we no longer have the true Messiah. That's what they hear. That's what they believe because they're applying the Word of God. They're applying Deuteronomy 13 and they're saying, well, he can't be the true Messiah because the true Messiah would never do that. And so we have come, become, mainstream Christianity has become to them just like the Samaritans. Yeah. Yep. You know, we see Israel, the patriarchs, the United Kingdom, Judah and Israel, you know, those northern kingdoms, they, they both kind of came together to be what the, the Jews and Judaism of the first century, in which you know, Yeshua was born into that world. The Samaritans were still off on their own, doing their own kind of thing. And so you know, Yeshua comes into that. And Messiah Yeshua 
Did, is this perfect? Is this system perfect that they have here? No, it's not. I mean, it's, it's got many factions. It's got a lot of corruption in the leadership. It needed correction, and it needed the true teaching of the Torah, right? Which is what Yeshua said he's coming to do. That's what Yeshua brought and taught. He, he brought correction. He brought the teaching the true way to his disciples. You know, an accurate biblical Judaism, the faith and practice of God in God's people. That's what Yeshua was doing. And because he was teaching the truth, because he was teaching things correctly and accurately, um, he wasn't always well liked mm -hmm. because of that. He rocked the boat. We don't always like. Tell me what I want to hear. Don't tell me what's true, right? Just say everything's fine. Don't give me this stuff that I need to fix something or change something. Heaven forbid that we have to change what we've always done. But so, in that, you know, with Messiah Yeshua coming along and correcting, I hope y'all can see that okay. Yeah. Messiah Yeshua is correcting things. He is passing on that knowledge to the, the apostles. He's creating... You know, the, the, what true biblical Judaism is supposed to be. And so he's creating the messianic community of what it's really supposed to be. And this is a, a community, a messianic community, where it's got a, a Jewish leadership. You know, all of the apostles were Jewish. The writers of the scriptures were Jewish. The Gentiles and things were added. Even the Samaritans are added to this new community. That he would make a nation of priests. Yes, absolutely. So this messianic community grew. It's expanding. It's starting out all Jewish uh, with Jewish leadership. The Samaritans are added in Acts chapter eight. The Gentiles are added in Acts chapter ten. It's doing what it's supposed to do, and but time passes. And the rejection of Yeshua among the Jewish people begins to increase. Right? We see that over time. So there is a blindness of the Jews to Yeshua and his identity as Messiah. And so that's going on. This is that, that partial hardening that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. And the, so the leadership then begins to shift in this messianic community as as the, the, there are fewer and fewer Jewish people coming to faith, the, the leadership begins to shift, and it's increasingly a Gentile leadership among the people of God. What time frame do you see that? It happens pretty quickly. I mean, you start seeing some of that conflict or that tension even in the book of Romans. So you're talking in the 50s and 60s, you're starting to see some tension. Because when the, the Jews in the, were kicked out of Rome, so, uh, even before that, in, in the early 50s, uh, the only people who were left were the Gentile believers. And so they were like, well, our leaders are all gone. Somebody's got to step up and do it. And then you know, some years later, the, the, the Jewish people were allowed to come back into Rome. This is before Nero, when Nero... Nero was about 64, 60 to 64. So that when the Jews were allowed to come back in, then they started having a butting of heads a little bit. And a lot of the book of Romans is about trying to settle that issue. Because what do the Gentiles like to do? What does Yeshua say that the Gentiles like to do when it comes to leadership? They like to lord it over. That's how he says, that's how Yeshua says, the Gentiles love to lord it over the people. But it's not supposed to be like that among you. Yeah, I didn't understand the notion of shepherd. So, the, the Gentiles are beginning to take over more and more uh, this new Messianic community. And it's also becoming increasingly anti-Jewish. Yeah. The more and more Gentile it becomes dominated, the more hostile toward Judaism and the Jewish way of doing things because they didn't grow up with all that stuff. It's different. It doesn't make sense to us. We don't have the, the leadership that can really train us in all of this stuff and it becomes increasingly anti-Semitic which affected many of their decisions of practice. It affected many uh, much of their theology and it then develops into what we know of and see and recognize as Christianity. Okay? It has a lot of elements in it that are 
hostile or anti-Jewish. It's been built into it. And so we, in Christianity, are almost in the same boat as the Samaritans. <laughs> My belief is the leadership of Christianity came from the Samaritans in between the year 50 and 70. That's an interesting concept. I'll have to hear more about that. But so, Christians, in a lot of ways, are looked at equivalent to the new Samaritans. We're seen by the Jews as we're, we're related to them. We're related to Judaism, just like the Samaritans. We share similar beliefs and foundations, just like the Samaritans did. Uh, we share similar scriptures just like they did. But we are still significantly different to the point that they could not fellowship or worship together. So they began kicking the Christians out of the synagogue. The synagogue, or the, the Christians began saying, don't even go in there to hear those things. Don't associate with them. Don't keep the Sabbath. Don't keep those feasts. We're going to break you know, the, the celebration of the resurrection away from Passover. We're going to call it something else. We're going to put it on a different day. And it becomes something that they don't even recognize anymore as being the same. We are seeing, seen as living by a different way and serving essentially a different God. And when you use the name of Jesus to most Jewish people, especially over there in the land, they'll say, oh, that's that, that pagan God that you guys talk about. The Christians, we are living in this legacy of the divide. You know, just like the, the northern and southern kingdom got divided, we are living in the legacy of the divide between Jew and Gentile. But it's that wall of hostility that was supposed to be taken down, right? Both sides have been using, putting bricks together to put it back up. Right? We both sides have rebuilt the wall. You know the, the Jewish people in rejecting Yeshua as Messiah, but the Gentiles have be rebuilt it by rejecting all the things that are Jewish, which include living by the Torah, and which led the Jews to then apply the, the Deuteronomy 13 test and say that well, if Yeshua is teaching and advocating what you say, then he there's no way he can be the Messiah. That's how they view us. That's how they see us. So in the eyes of the Jewish people, Christians may be similar, but we can't be living in the blessing of the Father. Instead, we must be living in the curse because we're going after another God who has other ways. So to Jewish eyes, we have been dazzled by all the miracles. We've been dazzled by the signs and the wonders, but we've been invited to leave his ways behind. And traditional theology feeds a lot of that. And then you add the near 2,000 years of official and sanctioned persecution of the Jews. Faith in Christ is, is viewed with skepticism at best. Mm -hmm. Dangerous in many ways. Mm -hmm. To the Jew. To, to them. them. Yeah. So, but Yeshua is the true Messiah. Because he never did advocate abandoning the ways of God. He never gave permission for his followers to embrace you know, the salvation and grace of God that's not based, uh, not including the obedience to Torah, because that leads to, uh, to lives of lawlessness and Torahlessness. In Christ, in Messiah, we are invited to live in the blessing of keeping all of those things without the fear of his judgment. When we, when we read Matthew 5, he says, Do not think that I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And that's seen in many ways as an idiom to say to teach correctly, to, to live it and show it accurately, what it's supposed to be. He says, Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the seraph shall ever pass away from the Torah, until all things come to pass. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, this one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. When we say that Yeshua gives us permission and he teaches us to say, we don't have to worry about the Torah anymore, we have just made him least 
in the kingdom of God. And we have made him a false prophet in the eyes of the Jewish people. In Messiah, we are invited to live in the blessing of obedience to the Father's instructions because what he gave us is good. The, the, the Torah is holy, righteous, and good. Not just for the Jews, but for all people who are invited into that community of Messiah. You know, he says it in Proverbs chapter 4, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention to gain understanding, for I give you sound learning. Do not forsake my Torah. Now, our father is who? him. These are his instructions, and we're asked not to forsake them. But forsaking them is what has contributed to this division between Jew and Gentile it's the re and the rejection of Yeshua by the Jewish people ever since. It's the restoration that we are seeing in our day. That's the future. <clears throat> That's where the Messianic kingdom is going. See, if this is our current situation, now this down here, right? This is this is kind of where we're at. That you still have a, a significant blindness of the Jews to Yeshua. You know, you have Christianity, which is still largely you know Gentile dominated. That's where we're at. Jews regard Christians and Christianity like they did the Samaritans. Then the fix to this situation should be pretty obvious. You see Christianity as Romans 11, 25 and 26 talks about. I don't have that passage up here because I wanted to leave this. Look over in Romans chapter 11. Verse 25 says, For I do not want you, to, you, brothers and sisters, to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own eyes, that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Okay? So, before anything happens here, something has to start happening over here. You have to start seeing the fullness or the maturity of the Gentiles. And that, that fullness is the word pleroma. It's a, it's a completeness or fullness of time and abundance, even of fulfilling. It's, uh, the, the definition talks about seeing a, the body of believers as that which is filled with the presence, the power, the agency, and the riches of God and Messiah. And so it's not just about a number. It's not just about a physical count. It's, it's talking about an, an understanding. You know, no longer those who are needing the milk, but we've moved on to the solid food as he keeps encouraging us to be about. It's so so part of this fullness and this maturity of the Gentiles is, you know, rejecting the hostility towards the Jewish people that has been around for centuries. And instead beginning to love and support them and encourage them and and help them. You start you've started seeing that in the last century or and a half or so more so, to where a lot of the people that are encouraging and trying to save uh, the Jewish people in World War II were, were believers, were Christians, that were advocating the nation of Israel were Christians. So it's all the Gentiles who are rejecting the hostility towards the Jewish people that's been built into our system some way, it's Gentiles who have an understanding of what it means to accept the invitation uh, to to the covenants, to join the covenants, uh, to become citizens of Israel, to become members of God's household, a child and descendant of Abraham by faith. When we start coming to understand what that really means, Gentiles who have a fuller understanding of the place and the role of the Torah that should have in the life of the believer, because we have been invited by the Messiah, even as Gentiles, to become partakers of all of it become grafted in to all of it. That's what this whole chapter is about. 
in chapter, Romans chapter 11, of being the Gentiles being grafted in, when we begin to understand that, then the temporary blindness of the Jewish people to the identity of Messiah will begin to be lifted. Right? And that's what we've begun to see yeah. more and more in the last 50 to 60 years or so. We're seeing more and more of this blindness being coming off. And so that temporary blindness to Yeshua is lifted. That's what he says. That partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then in this way, once you have the maturing of the Gentiles and you have the blindness being lifted, then that comes to Messiah's community. And we're back to what we're supposed to be. And how does he say it in verse 26? And in this way, all Israel will be saved. For as it is written, the deliverer shall come out of Zion, he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. All Israel is saved. In your view of this, do you see the Jews as having moved away from Torah as it was originally given to Moses by God? Well, rabbinic, even they themselves will say that rabbinic Judaism has changed. You know, it's, it's drifted a little bit. So while they still maintain the connections and a lot of those things to it, even they know that when they think of Messiah coming, they know that Messiah is going to correct the stuff that we're talking about and debating about and arguing about. They know that that's coming. Um, but it's, it, the identity of the Messiah is the, big, is the biggest thing. That's the most important thing that's in there. So once this starts happening, that's when the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile gets being brought down more fully. And it's never to be rebuilt again. It's, it's, it will join together in fulfilling the role of being what we're supposed to be, which is the light of the world, to be the light to the nations. And so all Israel is saved, you know, the full and complete Israel of faith. That's made up of Jew and Gentile. That's the, the mystery of God that's being completed as Revelation chapter 10 verse 7 talks about. And so we'll see Messiah on the throne. We'll see Him reigning from Jerusalem. And what does He teach? What does He send out from Jerusalem out into the world? Look over in Isaiah chapter 2. When Messiah is on the throne, he says in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it will come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Adonai's house will stand firm as head of the mountains and will be exalted above the hills, so all nations will flow to it. They're all invited. Then many peoples will go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Adonai to the to the house of the God of Jacob, then he will teach us what? He'll teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For Torah will go forth from Zion, and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. That's the future. That's where he's trying to bring everybody back to, is the community that will accept him, accept his identity of who he is and accept the, the identity he wants to create in us, the way of life. As Revelation talks about it, it's those who hold to the, who keep the commandments and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. Both are necessary. 